We're, of course, all here to see Cindy today talking about some great plans for your home landscape. I've heard this is a great one. Got a personal recommendation from the front desk. So I know it's a good one, Cindy. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm with the Master Gardeners. We are of Wake County. Uh, we are an uh, extension group. We, if you don't know about us, please look us up. We have lots of information, lots of resources. We do programs throughout the year. Uh, um, Farmers markets. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll lately we haven't done, but we do the Southern Home Show. Um, we do a lot of the arboretums. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about color throughout the year. And it's not hard to do. Uh, it depending on the way our seasons go. Some can be earlier. Some can be later. I've got a lot of different ones here. I hope that some of them you don't know about so that something's new for your, your landscape. I start off almost all the time with viburnums because I happen to love viburnums. They are um, uh, so many different varieties, but these are very early ones. The one here on the left, uh, you this, whoops. Um, there, wrong thing. This is a bud off of the Pink Dawn. That was the last week in December that that uh, bud came out. It stayed in bud until the middle of January when it started to bloom. And that top picture was taken in the middle of March. So you had a long period of bloom and it's a very fragrant. It's supposed to be one of the most fragrant and it really does have great smell. The Burkwoodie eye in the middle is a lovely bush. It's supposed to be deciduous, but in our area, it will keep its leaves most of the time. And you can sort of see that um, it gets a bronzy tinge in the winter time so that, you, that it just changes a little bit of color. But the real cold, it might drop a lot of its leaves. But it has really beautiful white flowers and they're also very fragrant. Korean spice on the right is a lovely bush. It, um, has those deep pink red flower heads and then they open to light pink and then almost white flowers that have a wonderful smell. That gets, most of these get to, the little pink dawn will only get to be about four feet tall. The Korean spice does get to be fairly tall but there is a compact uh, variety now. Red buds are a wonderful addition to the very early uh, part of the year. Circus uh, um, chinensis is the one on the left. It is a usually a multi-stemmed uh, shrub with the, um, but it doesn't get tall. It only gets to be about six or seven feet tall. That plant's been in the ground for about 20 years. It's just the beautiful bright fuchsia blooms. On the right hand side are our native red buds. The one in the front. This one is Traveler. That's, of course, a weeping variety. There are a lot of new weeping varieties out there now uh, with white variegated, different colors uh, of the leaves. In the center is a native um, red bud. It was a volunteer. I liked where it was, so I just left it there. In the back is Appalachian Red, which is a smaller, um, only to about 15 to 20 feet tall, whereas the native can be rather large, 25 feet or more. Deciduous azaleas are something that we don't use quite as much as I think should be used in the landscape. They're native, they're absolutely beautiful. They come in lots of different sizes. The colors are just amazing and the fragrance is wonderful. Mine at home right now are in bud, nice big old fat buds. And as soon as we get a few warm days in the end of February, it will um, start to bloom and has a great fragrance. The pink one is one that only stays at about four feet. The orange one in the middle, it gets to be about six feet. The one on the left, I didn't read the label properly and it's about 10 to 12 feet tall. You can keep them cut back. Uh, like most azaleas, they take very well to cutting, but if you read the label better than I did, you won't have to worry about that. At the bottom on the left is Carolina jasmine, which is a native, Does not it, it is a, a vine. This one's on a fence in Cary, just absolutely gorgeous yellow. It'll scramble along the ground. If it doesn't have anything to climb on, it will also just climb up into your trees or around 
shrubs that are, low, are near it. It's a very friendly vine. It's not like honeysuckle. It will not strangle your trees or girdle your plants. So it's a great one to have and just add that really, really early spring color and a wonderful fragrance. And the top, uh, these are some hardy orchids. We can grow these pretty well here. Uh, the Calanthe um, variety is, or species is a great one to have. This one was at my parents' house for a couple of years. They had to move, so I transferred them to my house when they shouldn't really have been moved. But as you can see, this one right here just popped right up, had beautiful blooms. They'll expand a little bit, but they're not going to be aggressive. The flowers last a long time. They come in a lot of different colors. I have the real pretty bright yellow. They're a little bit like hellebores where once the season's passed, you can sort of take off the old leaves and let the new leaves come up and be fresh. On the left here, we have Iphion, which is a teeny tiny little plant. The uh, leaves are probably not more than three to four inches long. They never get much taller than about two inches. And the uh, leaves do come out in the late fall, early winter. So you'll have the little strappy leaves and the pretty little green. The bulbs are not any bigger than your little fingernail. So you can tell that this little plant, you can tuck in lots of little corners, little places along edges where you may need a little spot of color some, somewhere. Then the flowers come out the, um, in March. So, and then it will go away in the summertime as it doesn't like our heat. On the right is um, Convalaria. It is a great shade plant, um, smells wonderful. It does spread some, but I have it in an area that has pretty awful soil and almost full shade, so it doesn't spread too much. They have new varieties that have um, striped leaves, lighter colored leaves, almost yellow, and pink flowers. So there's a lot, and if it gets a little too, uh, Aggressive, you can dig it up and give it to friends because it's known as the pass along. In the early spring, you have, well, on the left, we have Stokes Aster. It's a native. It says it's a herbaceous, which means it goes away in the summer, but this particular patch that I have is full sun, been there for eight years now and has never gone dormant. But in the early spring, you have these beautiful flowers that the pollinators just love. Uh, comes in this light purple, uh, there's a pink, uh, there's also a deep purple and almost a creamy white. It gets maybe eight inches tall and will spread. It does seed around, but you can always pull them up. In the center, we have columbine. There's a native columbine that I do not have. Um, it's a beautiful red that has a yellow edging to it. Um, this one is a hybrid but it's beautiful. It just comes up wherever it wants to. It does seed around a little, but again, they're easy to pull up. The, the leaves are very distinctive. They look almost like clover leaves with their shape. The flowers are really pretty. Um, once you cut them off, you have that really um, nice um, clover looking leaf left and the leaves will last all summer. Fresh ones will usually come out later. On the right, we have three different things up there. Up here, you can see these ruffled um, leaves up there are of the primula and the pink flowers are the primula flowers. Real pretty, lasts only a couple of weeks, but it's a beautiful little pot there. The uh, heart-shaped leaves are hardy begonia. Uh, it's a great plant. It does seed a little bit too, but again, leaves are very distinctive. You can pull them up. They're very easy to to scratch the surface and they'll be gone. Uh, but they start blooming in the end of the spring, first part of the summer, and they will continuously bloom until they're frozen uh, in, the, in the fall. Below that, we have Pieris, which is an evergreen bush. It's beautiful, uh, just the leaves and the shape. Uh, it can get a little bit taller. This one's supposed to be four to five feet tall. Right now on my plant, the um, strings that are, look like they're, the white strings are actually 
Little strings with green look like little peas on them right now. Pretty soon they'll turn white and it'll look like little pearl strings. And then at the uh, first part of March to the middle of March, they'll turn into the bells, which is its common name, temple bells. There's no fragrance to that, but it's a beautiful, long lasting. And then you have that real pretty green pearls and then the white pearls and then the bells later on. So there's a lot of variety there. In the center, we have, <coughs> excuse me, Japanese painted fern. And that's a great deciduous fern. When it comes up, it adds that real pretty color. It's not a common color with that burgundy and the silver green on the side. And then it has that lovely texture of a fern. The four on the right all are complete shade. They never see the sun. They're on the north side of my house and they do very well in that area. The one, the Stokes Aster is full sun. It can take up to partial shade. On the top right, we'll talk about him first. That is a great evergreen shrub. Um, it is the Ralston Hardy, it's a viburnum. It blooms in March. And then throughout the rest of the year, it will sporadically have a couple of flowers here and there. It stays small. It's only supposed to get to be about three or four feet tall. Mine's been in the ground now for about three years and it's just over two feet and about three feet wide. So it's a lovely plant. It's in full sun where I have it. It will take up to um, a partial shade with not quite as much flowering. The rest of the pictures are something that is really fun to grow and we can actually do really well with them. These are pitcher plants. This particular plant I've had for probably eight years hate to admit it, but it is in this black plastic uh, tub that you mix cement in. And I put them in there until I got them into my pond and they're still there. But they do beautifully. They never have an issue with um, being a little dry or being very wet. The, these are the blooms starting to come up. Then this is the bottom of the bloom once it's open. This is the top of the bloom with that gorgeous maroon. And this is a side view while it's still in full flower. And then this is when it's just about to start to go away. But it's so beautiful. And there's so many different kinds of pitcher plants. Um, of course, this is the pitcher. Um, and the cool thing is, um, if you go to Darwin Days that Trish does, um, we cut that sometimes and take it in and open it so people can see all the bugs that have been uh, consumed or being consumed in, in the plant. Um, there are all different kinds of sizes, uh, teeny tiny little pitcher plants and very tall ones. Some of the pitchers can get to be almost two, almost two and a half feet tall. But it's fun. And like I said, I'm growing it in a tub. Any kind of a water container would be wonderful to have. I love peonies, peonies are great. In this area, we have to do them a little bit more, a little bit more care to them. They have to be planted fairly high in the ground so that they get access to the cold because that's what sets their buds. They also need to be protected from our very hot afternoon sun. They really don't like that. And um, they'll survive it, but they just usually turn brown and start to fade away by midsummer if they don't get some of that protection. There are three different kinds. You have the herbaceous, which are these. They'll go away completely in the, in the winter. You have your tree peonies, which we can also grow here. They have uh, woody stems. And then there is the combination, the intersectional, where some of them will have um, woody stems. The buds will come up maybe about a foot or two onto the stem. They're beautiful. The smells are amazing. The colors are incredible. Just make sure you protect it from that afternoon sun. Into the spring, on the left, we have uh, Dutzia, which is a lovely little bush. Doesn't get very large, so you don't have to worry about pruning it. Put it in a nice spot, about two to three feet of room, and it should be very happy there. This one has um, light yellow leaves when they come out fresh, and then the beautiful pearl uh, flowers that come out pure white. There is a uh, variety out now that has pink flowers to it. 
In the center, um, clematis. This is one of the little bush clematis. It doesn't get very long, maybe two to three feet. Uh, there are quite a few of these now out. They're really fun. Have a short little trellis that they can grow up. I just let mine scramble along the ground or climb around or whoever happens to be next to them. They bloom earlier in the spring, but they also have per sporadic blooms throughout the rest of the year. And their seed heads look like little fuzzy pinwheels. So there's an added benefit to the pretty little flowers. They're not very big. That flower is probably only half inch to three quarters of an inch. So it's not very large. On the right is Sarissa um, snow rose. I love snow roses. It's an evergreen in most cases. It has really pretty white is the original, but then you can see here I have the um, pink when it will open up and then fade into a white. There's also a double flower, but I'm not real big on the double flower. I've never seen a pollinator go to the double. So I like keeping the single flowers where I have seen a pollinator from time to time. It's evergreen. You can see that there is a little white edging to this one. So it has a little bit of irrigation. Some of the different varieties will lose their leaves a little bit, half the leaves partially in the winter time, but then they come right back in the spring. Gets to be about two to three feet tall, although at the Arboretum here, they had one that was just about four feet tall that used to be out here. So they can get large. Reblooming iris. I love iris. If you give me an iris, I will plant it and I will be very happy. But if I'm spending my money, I'm looking at getting a two four here. So I got a bunch of reblooming iris a couple of years ago and I planted them and it has been great. The one on the left, you can see it's blooming in there. Back is the color in the fall foliage and they just gorgeous flower. The one in the center, it had a beautiful bloom in the spring and early summer. And then that picture was taken in um, October and it bloomed on into November and actually bloomed through the first two frosts that I had. And they come in all different sizes, but there's a one over there on the right that is a teeny tiny little one. He doesn't get over a foot tall. Oops, what did I do? Oh, goodness gracious, okay. Um, so we're now we're into summer. On the left is our native phlox. Um, I put in this picture, it's not really pretty, but that particular plant was planted the year before as one stock that we pulled up from the Waterwise garden, planted it. The next year I had two stocks. You can see what a beautiful flower uh, it's got now. And the butterfly is enjoying his lunch now this past year been about four years now, and it had like 10 or 12 stalks on it, just absolutely gorgeous. It will spread a little bit, but it's easy to pull up. Um, and if you put it in the back of the border or somewhere where it can be tall and not be in the way, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. In the center, and comes in all different kinds of colors. Coreopsis in the center, again, comes in a lot of different colors. This one happens to be a very light, uh, yellow, which is just, I think, really gorgeous, has a very soft, feathery foliage, which is great for something different. It lasts, oh, uh, probably a good six weeks of bloom because it'll start to bloom and then it blooms harder and then it fades out blooming. So there are a lot of blooms to it. Um, on the far right hand side, you have um, Nephophia, which is the red hot pokers. They are great. This particular one is the largest one. That poker is probably six to seven feet tall. Um, it's, it's gorgeous when it's in bloom like this. Now, most of the pokers are between two to three feet tall. The thin strappy foliage is evergreen. So that's a great different texture in the landscape. Uh, it likes full sun, will do okay in partial sun. The more, more sun, the more blooms. Below that is Giardia, which I didn't like until last year much. Uh, I'd taken that picture at the beach. It was a second street back, had this barren hill, but all these little bright green spots of Giardia there. And I said, oh my gosh, if it's doing well here, it must be a very hardy plant. Always heard it was, but I never bothered. 
I had one volunteer this year in my fence line. It started blooming in the middle of the summer and it didn't quit until it was frozen. It comes in lots of different colors now. They have some light or medium yellows, oranges, reds, and some with variegations on, variegation of the colors. In the center is um, crepe myrtle. A lot of people groan when you say crepe myrtle because they have a lot of problems with them. This day and age, there are so many different sizes of crepe myrtles that if you, you can pick the one in the right spot. I was doing research on this and they say there's one out there that only gets to be 18 inches tall. If that's true, I'll see if I can find it. Even if they're lying and it only gets, and it gets to be like two or two and a half feet. That's great. That's a wonderful plant. And you also have the ones that are four to five feet tall. I have a couple that are in that category. They've been in the ground for almost 10 years. They stopped at about five and a half feet and they haven't grown at all since. Beautiful. You also have the ones that are 12 to 15 feet, 20 feet, and then you have your giant ones, like the beautiful ones they have at the entrance way out here at the Arboretum. So you can have, and all different colors, they now have different foliage colors, they have some beautiful maroon. So you can, you can pretty much do well with, and then the flowers, everything from pure white to almost a crimson red now. The picture on the right is terrible, but I love that bush um, or shrub, I don't know what you wanna call it, plant. Um, it grew like crazy. It was planted just a year uh, and a half ago. It's two feet tall, about three feet wide, and most of the summer it was covered in these purple blooms. Um, I'm, so I'm really excited about how it's gonna do next year. It says it only gets to be um, two, two to three feet tall and four feet wide. And there's my little Giardia that volunteered on my fence line. On the left, this is Hippiastrum. It looks like an amaryllis, but there's only one true amaryllis. Amaryllis belladonna comes from South Africa. Uh, the Hippiastrum, which looks just like it, comes from Central and South America. And this is what we get at Christmas, um, as, and everybody calls it amaryllis. We can grow these here. This one is in my neighbor's yard. It's been there for six years. You can see it's doing very well. So if you've got an amaryllis from the holidays, save it, plant it out, see if it'll come back. We don't have anything to lose. And they come in all kinds of fun, it's a big statement, it's a bold statement out there. We have lilies. The tiger lily is um, a single stalk, can be up to seven to eight feet tall, has beautiful orange flowers. Some of them are yellow, some of them are darker, orange now, um, blooms over a fairly long period of time. You can see on this one, you have the spent flowers up here. You have the full flowers here with a butterfly enjoying it. This one will be out in about three or four days. And this one will probably be out in about a week or so. So it takes a nice long time for them to be blooming. Again, in the back of the border, and then the seed pods off of lilies are amazing in the fall against the really pretty blue sky, they're just beautiful. A lot of people get these confused, Asiatic and Oriental lilies. Easy way to remember it is Asiatic, it begins with an A, so it's first, it's the first blooming of the lilies. They are usually between um, two to four feet tall, lots of different colors, but they don't have much fragrance. Oriental lily down here begins with an O for odor, so it, um, has wonder, all the, the orientals have lovely fragrance. They get to be a little bit taller as mature plants, more around five to six feet tall. On the right is a calla lily, won't even pronounce the scientific name on that one. We can grow a lot of these. There are a lot that are zone eight, but there are some that are zone 7B, 7A, 7B. And um, this one's by my walkway into my house so that when I'm walking past it, I can look down in those beautiful spaces and see that gorgeous purple. Then when the flowers are gone, this one's probably about seven years old and you can see how many blooms it has on it. When they all fade away, you still have the um, speckled leaves and the weavy edges, which is still enjoyable to see all year long. Butterfly bushes are some, something else people complain about. They say, 
They get too big, they seed around, not anymore. The new breeding that they have done on this, there are quite a few that will stay small. This is called Pugster Blue here. Uh, the chip variety that have a lot of the chips here at the Arboretum, they will stay small with hardly any pruning at all. Um, and they'll bloom all summer long into the fall. Some of them have um, fragrance to them, but you can see the pollinators love them. On the right-hand side, there are so many different types of salvias and we can grow so many of them. I particularly like the ones with the um, rosettes at the bottom or the very short plants that send up the spires. They bloom from the bottom up, so you have a long period of blooming. And you can see on the top one that um, they have the two big blooms. There's a little one coming and there are four more just starting to come up. So it's gonna bloom over a long period of time. The one on the bottom, if you deadhead them, they will come back again uh, later on in the summer. In the center, Lycoris, I can be an expensive purchase because it's just a little bulb. But when you get this kind of a show out of it, it is very much worth it. It's called a surprise lily because the leaves will come up about now, they will just have their, their leaves. It looks a little bit like daffodil leaves. Um, and they're just gaining all their energy so that in the late, sum or late summer, they'll just all of a sudden, they go away, I'm sorry. The leaves in the winter time go away in the late spring. And then in the late summer, all of a sudden you have the flower stalk pop out of the ground. Seems like overnight. And then you have this beautiful display of, spidery looking flowers, gorgeous colors. They have le uh, lemon yellows. They have the pretty reds, this purple one on the left and a lot of different colors in between. Late summer, uh, asters, this is purple dome. We have that at the Waterwise Garden. We cut it back in June to half. That takes the bloom period a little bit later because we need it to look good in October for the fair. It also keeps it from getting too tall so that it doesn't flop over as much. Comes in lots of different color. It is native. It is a wonderful plant. Uh, pollinators love it. And it blooms over a very long period of time. Calicarpa in the middle is American Beautyberry. Has beautiful, well, has insignificant little flowers, but they turn into these beautiful um, bright fuchsia berries. There's a lot of breeding done with those. They have white ones. They have ones that are a light pink. I think that's Welsh's pink. They also have some that are deep purple. It's, and, and it can be a good food source for birds. On the right, we have uh, Rebecca. There are a lot of different types of Rebecca. Some are very short, staying only to maybe eight to 10 inches tall. Then there's the two foot range. And then you're there using a large one called uh, Maxima gets to be about six feet tall, but that's a, an unusual, and it never spreads, but the other two do. And you can keep them in control. They're not gonna spread like crazy. They will be around, but you can always take them out, but they bloom over a very long period of time. See, this, guy, this guy's gone, this guy's full out, and then you have these two that are gonna be out in another week. So you have them on a nice long blooming time. In the, second, in the center is Echinacea. Okay, the A decided to hop down there. Um, I prefer the regular ones, just the plain, because the pollinators love them. I have really good success with them. Uh, I, I have the white and the purple. I'm trying one that's a red now, but they come back. If you deadhead them, you'll have a second bloom, but then leave that last bloom and you'll have finches and goldfinches throughout the fall and the winter. We've already talked about asters, but solidago is something a lot of people, again, they don't, they say, well, it's just a weedy plant. Not anymore. There are a lot of varieties that stay much smaller. Uh, there are ones that will stay much more confined. They won't spread out like the old fashioned kind does. They bloom in the very late fall. They have a long blooming period. Everything in the world loves to be on them. Bugs, bees, flies, everything enjoys them and they come in lighter yellows, almost an orangey yellow, lots of different colors too. On the right is blackberry lily. You can see, whoops, wrong thing. 
has this real pretty flower. It's a stalk. It's related to the iris. And the flower stalk comes up. Um, and you have your buds at the, where the spent flowers are up here, the seed pod. That will get to be about an inch long, about a half inch wide. And when it gets dried out and pops open, that's where it gets its uh, common name as the blackberry lily. And those little blackberries hang on for a long time. So it's fun to look at. Uh, rhodia is a great plant. It's something that can be sort of expensive, but again, I think it's well worth it. It's evergreen. My japonica on the right has been um, there. It gets to be about two, two and a half feet tall. It will expand a little bit. And that one is just about to the point where I need to get up the nerve to pull it up and divide it out. But it has an insignificant flower. I don't think I've seen the flower but one time. But then it has these real pretty little red berries at the bottom that are just adorable when you're passing them and they sort of pop out at you. They have the variegated varieties. They have small ones. This one down here is a very small one, only gets to be about eight to 10 inches tall. It is variegated, but it had a tough year, so you don't really see much of the variegation on it. In the fall, you have a uh, farfugium, which is a great little plant. It stays put, it's evergreen, it blooms in almost total shade, uh, has a long blooming period where it'll bloom over several weeks. And it has real pretty leaves. Some of them are now spotted or wavy. There are a lot of different varieties of the farfugium now that are really fun. Pulmonaria is usually blooms in the wintertime um into march but the leaves are actually starting to come up in november and december right now mine are beginning to start to put out their flower stems and they will be blooming in probably the next week or two and then they will bloom off and on all winter long never bothered by our cold weather at the bottom we have colchicum which is a um it's called um autumn clematis i mean autumn sorry crocus because it's sort of like the Lycoris. It'll send up its leaves in the early spring, do its thing with the leaves, and then they disappear. Then in the end of September, the first part of October, the flowers will just pop up. So it's something, and they can be sort of expensive too, but it's a great plant or a great bulb to be able to tuck again into little corners where you don't want something all the time, but if on the long of the edge, you get the strappy foliage in the spring, and then you have this real fun little flower that comes up in the fall and just makes you smile when you get to see it, and then it goes away. Everybody who knows the Arboretum knows that they have that beautiful um, Japanese maple in the circle. I think it's a great plant. It can be also sort of expensive to get the initial, but once you've got it, it is there. It is beautiful. It does really well, obviously, in full sun. Um, it will do well in almost full shade. Uh, this one is a regular green, but it turns this beautiful uh, bright red in the fall. Then when those leaves are gone, you have the gorgeous bonsai effect of the tree itself. This one is one by my house that has a golden um, orange Fall, fall foliage, and that was with the light on it, making it just shine. On the bottom right is that same plant, no leaves, but again, the light shining on it just makes it just so beautiful in, in the wintertime at night. And then here was a couple of years ago. It wasn't just the other day, but this was a couple of years ago. Again, it shows that beautiful shape of those um, Japanese maples. Camellias, everybody knows camellias. There are probably 15 different species actually of camellias. The two that we most familiar with are Camellia sinensis and Camellia, um, I'm sorry, Sasanqua. <laughs> sinensis is the tea, is the tea camellia. Sas, uh, Sasanqua is the, oops, has smaller leaves mostly and blooms earlier. Japonica has the bigger leaves normally and blooms a little bit later. You can get Sasanquas that will bloom as early as uh, September, October, November into December. Um, I have one that still has a few blooms hanging on, 
just about done. But then Japonica starts in sometimes the end of December, but mostly January, February, and into March. So there you've covered five to six months of color with just um, two different plants. And they have colors, everything from pure white to they have almost a um, burgundy black almost now. Their uses can be so varied. That's what's so nice about them. This person um, planted along a, a driveway, planted them nice and far away, let them grow for about three years, and then he started trimming them. And right now he has a beautiful hedge that has gorgeous flowers on it for about three months out of the year. Down here, this person put their uh, Sasangua in front of their house to protect it from the sun in the summertime. Over here, this one, there are three Sasanquas there. They're the old fashioned kind that get huge. And she used those as a sight block for her neighbors. And the added benefit is no neighbors get to be seen. And then she has the flowers for two, two months or better. The top, this person decided to make it look more like a tree. They limbed it up and made it into a tree form has tons of pink flowers on it now, and you can see the flowers at the bottom. So it's been blooming for about two months. In the winter time, uh, Mother Nature provides for her creatures by having plants that will bloom in the winter. I love a Prunus mume. Uh, there are some smaller ones that maybe only get to be about eight to 10 feet tall, but most can be fairly big. They can get up into the 12 to 15 foot range easily. But you can see that when the sun's out, the creatures are on it. Mother Nature also knows that we're gonna have a lot of cold weather and it's gonna frost the plants. So the, the um, blooms that are out full, they may get frozen, they may get frosted, but she makes sure that there are ones that haven't opened, the ones that are still gonna be way behind and they will come out in another few days and be ready for the next warm spell. Down here is a white snow leopard. It is actually the fruit on a prunus mume. For some reason last year, I had fruit that actually came out. I was so excited. I didn't know what it was at first. I said, what's on my plant? Looked at it, took a picture. A week later, I came back to take another picture and they were all gone. So I don't know whether something ate them, didn't see them on the ground, but they were all gone. On the right, we have hellebores. Hellebores are a wonderful evergreen, low, love the shade. Most people say they're deer resistant. Um, this is the older type where the flowers were down. You used to have to plant them up high so that you could see the beautiful flowers. But with the new breeding they're going on, the flowers now face forward and some of them even face up, come in every color from pure white to um, that uh, purple black that they have. This is a new one that I've got thanks to the Arboretum. I have two of these. They've been in the ground. Um, this one's been in the ground for two years. It's a terrible picture on the right, but you can see all these little brown, look like brown spots are actually these little flower heads. Um, and I just took that picture a week ago. So um, I'm very excited. It did really well last year because we didn't have much of a winter. This year, I'm really excited that I got all these flowers. The flower, I didn't put a picture of the flower because I didn't get permission to put it on. So, um, but it's a yellow, sort of a light yellow color with almost a bronze to it. Looks a little bit spidery. So I think I am very excited about that, but it's supposed to do well here. I think you all have one here that's been around for a while. Oh, have you? Oh, no. Well, now that is what this has. This one is in my fence line, which is, has been dug and fixed. The other one is on a slope. And um, so it does have good drainage. Edgeworthy is one of my favorite bushes. It's a gorgeous plant all year long. You can see that, oh, that it's a multi-stem trunk most of the time. This one, they trained it up for a single trunk. Uh, it doesn't ever really need pruning because yeah, the way it grows, it's almost always a nice rounded shape. In the spring, it has nice, long, strappy leaves that are really uh, sort of tropical looking. Then in the fall, they fall off and they're sort of a light yellow. And that lets you see the new flower buds that are coming on it. Then as you get into um, the end, well, 
the end of January, the first part of February, you'll start getting on warm days, little flower buds will open up and the fragrance is amazing. And they keep opening up on warm days until they're all totally open and just enjoy that lovely buttery color with the lovely smell with it. There are some now that are a light pink and sort of one that's an orange, light orange, and they do stay smaller. They're not quite as large as this one. Mine is um, about six to eight feet tall, depending on where you're standing. But it's a, it's a pretty thing. Winter Sweet, I love this bush. It um, has, th this is two different ones. I like the lemon yellow myself, but again, Mother Nature has provided so that when these go away, you have these smaller buds that in another couple of days or a week will come out to provide food for the pollinators that come out, the little creatures that come out in the wintertime. Top right is Daphne odora that is um, an evergreen shrub, comes in green, or this is a variegated form. The flowers are either a lavender, sometimes this real pretty uh, pink, fuchsia pink, they will, uh, this one's not in flower, this one's just in bud. When it's in flower, it will be almost half of that color. So just beautiful. They are very, very needy of well-draining soil. Uh, this is my, well, uh, there's, I have, my neighbor has one and it's in a northern part of the house. It is um, surrounded by azaleas and on the edge of a crepe myrtle. So I think that helps take care of any water problems. This one down here is the deciduous Daphne, something I've got on my wish list. Uh, supposed to have a wonderful fragrance and um, supposed to be just as a little bit easier than the other one. You just don't see it very often. Jasmine nudiflorum or the winter jasmine does not have a fragrance. So that name is a little bit misleading, but it's a great plant if you have an area or a hill that needs to be covered. Uh, everywhere it touches the ground, it will pretty much root. The stems, instead of being brown like most stems would be, are green, so that adds a little more color to the area that's being covered. I have it coming over a wall. It started blooming the first part of December. It's still blooming and is in full bloom and will bloom probably for another two or three weeks. So you get a lot of color. And it will do okay even in full shade, just won't have quite as many blooms. Fruits and berries. This over here is a Japanese persimmon. I was in Cary a couple of years ago, saw this gorgeous bright orange ornaments it looked like in a tree. Took the picture, you can see it has snow on it. And plus that's a wonderful fruit, it's great to eat, but it's really pretty in that leaving on the tree. Hollies have the most beautiful berries. Some of them are the bright red, some can be orange. They even have some yellow ones now. And they last through the winter. In the spring they have, when they have their flowers, their wonderful fragrance. Here is one that is a weeping form. This one I just got, it is our native winter berry. It's a holly, it has a beautiful red berries on it. You do need a little boy to help pollinate these. So I have to find myself a, a little guy, a big dandy, I think is the one that I need to get. But you can see these beautiful red berries. This is just a small plant um, and I'm very excited about that. Don't know why I haven't had one before. Early signs of spring, of course, daffodils and crocus. Um, with daffodils, you can get daffodils nowadays. You can get them as small as three or four inches. You can get the very tall ones early blooming and late blooming. Same thing with the crocus. You have the small crocus and you have the taller ones. Galanthus in the middle is a great plant. It comes up this time of year. It's already poking up in my yard. It's also called um, snowdrop. These little lanterns are just pure white and some of them have little green spots on them that can just be absolutely gorgeous when you have them in the barren ground. Magnolias, most people can't have a southern magnolia in the yard. I am really excited about this one because it's supposed to stay about four to five feet wide, but get to be about 12 feet tall. He's been in the ground for two and a half years. He is only about two and a half, three feet wide, and he's already about eight to 10 feet tall. So an evergreen has that beautiful magnolia flower and fragrance. 
These are deciduous magnolias. Um, this is called the Little Girl series. There are about eight of them with, with girl names, different sizes. This guy is only about six feet tall, been in the ground for 10 years. This one's about eight feet tall. Um, and then this guy back here, Betty, she's about 12 feet tall. So there are lots of different sizes. You can limb them up a little bit so they don't get quite so floppy. They can be more upright. Stellata or the star magnolia is a deciduous one also. A lot, obviously they come in different sizes. This is a white one and the pink one, bought them at the same time, but I knew they were different. And um, this one, the white one has topped out at about six feet tall, whereas the pink one is close to uh, 15 feet tall. Lovely fragrance on them. Foliage is also something to consider for color all year long. The Akubas, um, with the new breeding that they have, they have all different kinds of sizes, shapes, colors, variegations, thin leaves, thick leaves. The Camociferous in the middle uh, will stay at that shape. And if it has lots of sun, it will also stay nice and bright. Carex is usually considered a shade plant, but there are varieties that will do well in the sun. They have um, varieties that are striped and variegated and they have nice flowers. Here's a holly that has the real deep green center with the white edge. And then the heucheras, which are native, they also have lots of breeding lately. It has great texture of the foliage, lots of different sizes and shapes there, plus all the new colors. The one on the left is something I got here, um, put it in as the ground as one little sprig about three years ago, and it's now spread to almost a foot wide, stays that real pretty uh, green and white striped all year long, and it's in almost full shade. Cystus on the right, I killed that once, not the right drainage. Um, this one is, again, on a nice hill, good drainage, love the color. It's a terrible picture, but has that bright yellow with the white cream to it, and it has white flowers, and it will get um, about three feet by three feet. Osmanthus, this is Goshiki. I've had it for a long time. I never thought it would ever bloom. Um, December 7th, I was out there and I saw blooms on it, had a wonderful fragrance. Uh, when I went back a week later, it was gone. So it blooms over a very short period of time. But also while I was there, I found a um, patch of almost pure white uh, leaves on it, which I thought was fun. Uh, last thing to talk about are grasses and barks. Grasses can be a great addition to the fall winter garden. This campus uh, on the far right and the far left, one on the left with those nice pretty seed heads and a feathery look with the wind on them and the sun shining on them, they get a nice um, movement in your garden. The one on the right has a lot more structure to it, looks more formal. The one in the middle is the pink muley grass. There's also a white variety. It gives that real soft, almost ethereal look to your garden. And as long as they don't get heavy with ice, they last pretty much through the winter. Bark on the right is, of course, um, crepe myrtle, which you can just grow it for the bark by itself. Chris mentioned that y'all are gonna be learning about the paper bark maple. That's one in the middle. That guy's only about three or four years old and he's already looking gorgeous. And Zelkova on the right has that nice speckly bark. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. We greatly appreciate you being here today to talk to us about some great colorful plants in the landscape. I haven't seen any questions here in the chat, but if anyone has any questions, go ahead and you can unmute yourself right now and we can hear you through our speakers or you can go ahead and uh, do your question, of course, in the chat. Does anyone here in person have a question for Cindy? Oh, got yes, one from Marilyn. You said about um, peonies um, here in the South, we need to treat them a little bit differently. Yes. And you said plant them fairly high. So yes. Can you repeat the um, question for the online audience? Oh, yes. Uh, peonies need to be planted a little bit higher in the ground here. Up north, they can be planted two or three inches deep. Here, they need to be just barely below the soil line, maybe an inch. 
and make sure that you do not cover them in the winter with mulch. You can cover them in the summertime to protect the roots from the heat, but they need that cold to um, set their buds. Any more questions here in person? Looks like no questions in person. Let me go see if we have a question in chat. I don't know why I'm going from one computer to another, <laughs> but hey, that's what happens. Get your steps in today. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, it's looking like we don't have any questions in the online chat. Uh, okay. So it looks like we are, oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Here's a question for you, Cindy. Okay. Uh, it was a direct message one. Uh, someone has a Edgeworthia to plant out in the spring. What is the best site? Can you describe where to plant the Edgeworthias? Uh, they will actually do okay in full sun because we have ours at the Waterwise Garden in almost complete full sun. Mine at home is in almost complete shade. It's shaded by the house. It gets a little bit of morning sun. So I think as long as you plant it where it has good drainage and that sound, you know, it's back and forth, but lots of good moisture so that it doesn't get too dry in the summer if it gets a lot of sun, should be just about anywhere. And make sure you know the size because if it gets to be like mine, it can get very large, but some of the smaller ones you can plant in um, a little bit smaller areas. Interestingly, our other online question <laughs> was pretty much the same thing, and you just answered that oh, one for okay, Sarah. Good. That's great. Marilyn, what's your question? Um, the hippiastrum. Yes. Uh, what does it want in terms of soil moisture? How much sun? Hippiastrums, um, the lookalike of amaryllis, they will take full sun. They love full sun. They will do very well there. They need good drainage because it's a bulb. It needs good drainage, but it needs nice moisture. So more like the winter drier than the summer. Um, it will do okay in partial sun. You will not get as much flowering in um, partial shade. It, it may skip a year here and there because it needs the sun on the leaves to make the bulb strong for the next year to bloom. So the more sun, the stronger the bulb's gonna be. And I've had one in a pot for three years and it keeps blooming. <laughs> Hardy they are very hardy. I had one that got almost totally dried out, watered it. I mean, I won't even put those pictures up because I'd get taken to the, you know, uh, plant society for cruelty, but uh, watered it. It filled back out and it bloomed almost four months later. So they're very hardy. You, you keep the, them in a pot outdoors? No, she was just saying she had hers in a pot. No, mine's in the ground. I have them in the ground and in a pot. Okay. I, I've got, people gave me tons of those things over the last 50 years, and I have too many. <laughs> I'm sick of them in the house. Well, there you, you can start experimenting. In the yard. Yeah, stick one in the full sun, stick one in a sloped area, stick one. And, you know, if they come back wonderful, if they don't, then you've, Learn something. <laughs> At least the deer don't eat a Marilyn. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a question in here from Stasia, and she was uh, commenting that she lives in Virginia in zone 8A, and she was wondering what our zone is here in Raleigh. We are zone 7B. We supposedly get between 5 and 10 degrees Fahrenheit. We haven't seen that in a few years. Our low temperature was actually this past weekend, and I know my thermometer got down to 14. Yep. I don't know what anyone else has got to, but I uh, was 15. Pro so. Probably <laughs> the mid teens or so for, for our area. So we, we are now in zone eight so far this winter. I'm kind of hoping that was it. I was talking to Cindy that I'm kind of hoping this is the last weekend and go back to the 70s. <laughs> I, I'm sure we have a good couple Not more months. Quite of that weather. Right there yet, but hey. I got kind of babied with that 70s over the holidays. That was, oh, that was rather yes. lovely. Yes, oh, ma'am. Marilyn, there's another question? I do have another question. You uh, talked about the primula. Yes. And I'm originally from New England, and I'm used to them outdoors, and they just do beautifully out there. And when I grow them here, um, they just don't seem to like our heat. I try to put them in a shady, cool, cool spot, and I can get maybe I can get them to come back maybe once or twice, you know, right years. They can but be they a short one here. Now, my I have the 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 one that I showed you has that uh, um, wavy leaf with the long flowers. 
that one has come back seven years. Wow. So what? What? It's on the north side of my house, so it doesn't really get much sun at all. You know what species that one is? Uh, Sabultii. It's on there. It was um, uh, pink, pink. What? Yeah. It may be it. Yes, it was one. Of, it, I got it from uh, Plant Delight, so you can look at their catalog and see what what variety looked mm -hmm. just like that. But it was a very. I also have the ones that look like the ones you get at florist shops. They sometimes don't come back after about three or four years, but I have one that's just popped up about three weeks ago, and it is four years in the ground now. Wow. I but again, it's on the north side. Okay. It gets really good drainage. Um, and it, the only sun that that one gets is morning sun. Okay. I've, I've started buying the ones like Lidl was selling them for $1.99, <laughs> you know, um, and I treat them as annuals. I, I plant them out in a pot on my covered front porch in January and they bloom all through the spring. They bloom until it gets really hot. Yep. So I figure, OK, it's it's a it's like a pansy. You know? <laughs> well, they do go away in the summer with that heat. They really hate it. So. Um, and some of those are a little bit more tender than than what we are here. But again, if you plant them and they come back, you're you're doing really well. Okay. Thank uh, you. I was going to comment that I thought Plant Delights had one. So thank you for adding that. Yes. And I think also uh, Camellia Forest is known for having. Yes, some they good are. Primula yes, for this they area. Are. Let me let me just check the uh, chat and see if anything else has come in. Uh, so Heather is wondering, are there any camellias that will uh, handle full sun all day? And Camellia Sasanqua definitely is one yes, of them. Yes, it will. Um, yes, Sasanqua is great for that. And if you start a japonica out little and well taken care of, it will adapt. It's not going to like it, but it will adapt. But the Sasanqua is the best one for full sun. Okay. And uh, just working on scrolling down, everyone. I don't have a mouse, so I'm <laughs> not, not, not the best one with this uh, laptop without it. Uh, Stacy commented, uh, it is hardy here. I don't know exactly what she's talking about. It has a question mark after it. So sorry, Stacy. I don't know. I'll help you Pretty with that much one. everything I showed is either in my yard or in a neighbor's yard or someone I know who's it's in their yard. So it would be pretty much hardy here. And John's wondering what plants flower with peonies. And I know irises are very much at the same season and are two lovely classic yes. plants that flower right along with each other. Always look great in the home landscapes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're right with the iris, but I'm, can you think of anything else that? I, I can't, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, but just to help you out, um, uh, if you check our website, we have a, a feature on there where you can see the different flowering periods of the plants and now showing is one of the ones and the peonies flower quite often around late April and early May in our area. So just look for the dates where you see plants and flower uh, for the late April and early May season. So that should help you out um, to see what also flowers in there. But iris are definitely definitely a classic in there. Okay, I'm just trying to read some of the chats. And uh, Heather, yeah, your Camellia Sasanqua was a handle full sun. I've seen quite a few of them in full sun. Uh, question maybe you can't handle. I'm not too sure if I can uh, help out either. Uh, Judy, who's one of our people from a little bit further south, lives in zone nine, was wondering if the intersectional peonies can grow well in zone 9A. I'm not too sure about that myself. If the local garden I, centers have it, I would think it'd be okay down there, but I don't know. I am not sure because I know they're more northern and we can do them really well here. Yeah. I would say. I mean, they're expensive to buy, but yes. if she wants to try it, make sure it gets afternoon shade. That would be my biggest thing for a zone nine. And uh, if she really, really wants to do it, pile ice on it. <laughs> so <once her time. laughs> just kidding. Judy. Those, those tree peonies, <laughs> colors on them are just spectacular. Yeah, I've never been fond of a yellow peony, but that Bartzella, oh my gosh. Can't that, argue that with it. That thing's hot stuff. <laughs> That's a great looking At peony. At one time I had 30 blooms on my Bartzella. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. 
I'm just, uh, so my uh, chat keeps on moving. I, I now know why what's uh, going on over here. So I think that might be it for the question. I'm just doing a little scroll through. Yep, that looks like that is the uh, end of the chat question. So I think that'd be a great place to stop. Thank you so much, Cindy, Excellent. for joining us today. We appreciate you being here for a great lecture on a wonderful uh, snowy Monday, if you will. <laughs> uh, so glad you can join us here online and, of course, here in person. I hope to see you again real soon, especially this coming Wednesday for our great uh, Gardening 101 program. See you all later. Have a great week. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.